Greetings, viewers. Well, here we are on a beautiful sunny day in paradise. And it happens to be the year of the rat, uh, which, by the way, is for real. I am having more trouble with rats this year. Oh, my goodness. It's awful. There are so many of them. And worse, I don't have any neighbors here that are doing any control at all. And so it's costing me a fortune on my side of the fence to be able to put out rat bait because nobody else is doing anything about it. It's a common problem uh, with rat infestations, you know, that um, the people who really have them don't believe they have rats. Uh, it's only the people that are out there knowing they have rats and controlling them that know how many rats there actually are. And so my suggestion to all of you is put out some rat bait and look to see what happens. I mean, you might get an unpleasant surprise. Um, I know California was just infested with the things when I lived there. It was horrible. Uh, the whole Bay Area, just there's rats everywhere. And uh, I don't know if they jump the ships at the Port of Oakland or, you know, what, what they're all about. But... And there are a lot of them. And there's even more people who don't think they have rats in the Bay Area. Um, they guess they figure they're too cleanly or something. Well, trust me, you can be real neat and clean and still have rats. Um, they'll use your house as cover. and crawl in your attic and use that as a space to live, you know. So you don't have to have garbage laying around to have rats, trust me. <clears throat> Anything that they can make a house out of is going to draw them. Yeah, so it's bad. It's real bad. Worse, I went to the farm store today to buy more rat bait. Guess what? There is no more rat bait left at the farm store on the island. Uh, it's sold out. You're the rat. Uh, as well as the slug bait, which is the other half of our rat lungworm problem here, which is really what I want to talk about today. Uh, and because that is a two-fold problem, um, I'll start with the basics, the disease, and then move on from there to rats and then slugs. Um, the basics of this disease are that the rat carries a nematode parasite called a lungworm. Um, the rat passes it in rat turds. A few years back, we got a slug on the island here called the semi-slug from Southeast Asia. Uh, he's got a it's a pretty good sized slug. It's got a little toenail on the back of it. Uh, it looks like a sort of a snail shell in a way. Uh, it's halfway between a snail and a slug. Well, this thing eats rat turds. And when it eats rat turds, it carries the lungworm with it. And then if it goes over and it eats your lettuce and gets slime all over the lettuce, it can pass the parasite out in the slime. And if you get there and you pick the lettuce and you start eating it without washing it properly, uh, it will pass into you. And uh, when this first got to the island, before hardly any of us knew anything about this parasite, I ended up getting it. I was cleaning slugs out of flower pots here, and I wasn't using caution because I was not used to using caution on slugs in California, uh, nor where we really dialed into the fact that we had a problem here either. So I probably accidentally had slime on my fingers or something and must have groomed my mustache. I don't really know how I did it, but I wasn't eating produce, I can tell you that. And, uh, well, I got it. And I took it back to the mainland with me. And uh, on the mainland, they'd never heard of such a thing. My doctor, I noticed on his notes when I went in telling him that I was ill, <laughs> wrote down something about Bill Report's uh, infestation of exotic parasite. I, I could have probably just as well have told him that I'd been probed by aliens, you know, and I needed some preparation age. Uh, he'd have taken it about as seriously. So I ended up going through the disease from one end to the other, which for me was about a month and a half long pounding headache. Uh, I developed a, uh, a inability to take ibuprofen after that because I had to take so much of it I burned a hole in my esophagus trying to kill the pain. Um, and, and then when it finally passed after a month and a half it left me with maybe a week long partial paralysis in the right arm and the right leg which passed. And so these days 
I feel good again. That was quite a few years ago. Um, it took, you know, probably two months roughly to recover from the infection. Now, they tell me that I got it light compared to the way some people get it. My immune system is pretty tough, and it did a good job of killing the parasite off. I guess that's where the headache comes from. It, the parasite can't get into the human lung, and it won't stay alive in the human body long, but it will colonize in the uh, lower brain stem, top of the spinal cord, temporarily, and then the headache is caused by our immune system killing it off. Uh, boy, it's a whopper, too, and a long one. So, that's the disease, and then let's talk about the causes, and number one, number one is the rat, because it's the, the rat is the one that actually carries the parasite originally, and the rats are actually the easiest portion of the equation to control. I heard a story this morning at the farm store about a lady who only wanted to buy one bar of the stuff because she said she only has one rat. And then she came back claiming, well, it didn't work. I still got that rat. Yeah, right. <laughs> there is no such thing as one rat. The rat is always an infestation. Always an infestation. There's always at least one family. And if nobody's been doing anything about it, there are many, many, many families. You probably have uh, a Honolulu <laughs> living in your backyard of rats if you haven't been doing anything about it. So... There are a whole lot of different ways a person can control a rat. I mean, there's the trap, you know, common old-time snap victor job here, you know. Wow. Now, whatever you do, don't ever put your fingers on the business end of one of these because I've accidentally gotten in there at times in the past, and, man, will you get busted? I've almost broken a finger uh, that way. So, yeah, they're set from this end, from the non-business end. Wow! Like to get that in your finger. A trap like this can be put out with a bait. Uh, you know, peanut butter works pretty well. It sticks to the trigger. The rats seem to like it. Um, you can do that. Although I find rats are pretty smart, and if they ever once figure out that's a trap by seeing their buddy in it or something like that, they are not going to go back to that trap again. Um, I find that they're best set in gangs, where you have one trap facing one way, one the other way, another one here, another one there, and reversing the direction of the triggers. So as they try to sidestep through this, they will probably accidentally hit one of them with their tail, and then it sets them off. So uh, they're best if they're used uh, on rat runs, so it means you have to be thinking like a rat, where are the rats going, you know, uh, and so on. If you just lay them out in the wide open, there's not a very good chance too much is going to happen. Here in Hawaii, we have a lot of what I call roof rat or tree rat, the long-tailed rat that climbs only in the trees, hardly ever goes to the ground. In a case like that, I have used traps and baits on them in trees. And I would tie the traps to the limbs of the tree, you know, usually between the trunk and where the fruit was that they were going after or something like that, uh, and would get rats uh, that way. I Here in, Cal in Hawaii, I put bait stations in my trees uh, and fill them with rat bait. Uh, it seems to work when they're hitting the fruit. And they'll go right for the rat bait too. Um, otherwise, a little simpler to use, a little safer uh, than the, the rat trap is the glue board. And again, I like to use these in gangs. I will often put out 12 of them or something. If I got like bananas on a counter or something in the carport and the rats are were going after them, I'll circle the whole bunch with a bunch of these glue boards. And uh, we usually get a few of them anyway. So the glue board, uh, although, you know, you get a rat on a glue board, you're basically just going to take it and toss it because you're not going to get the rat back off. These are not reusable. So that's... Uh, that's two ways you can do this. Traps, one way or another. Um, otherwise, I'd say the most popular way to get rid of rats is with rat bait. Um, and yeah, I definitely use more rat bait than I use traps because the rat bait requires a little less attention. Although if you've got a good infestation, you got to be filling your bait stations every day too. Uh, so let's start off with a proper bait station. You don't want to just be taking rat bait and tossing it around the neighborhood. This is not the way to do it. 
you want something like this where you can go ahead put your bait bars in here load this up as your dispenser and put that on the end of it like that and then nothing but rats or mice are going to go inside this thing after the bait you're not going to get the dog in there you're not going to get um, birds going after it and things if you take this if you have uh, pets around or issues with wild animals that are large wire it down find a tree a fence post to put a stake in whatever they wrap some wire around it and wire it down so nothing could pick this up and carry it away um, this is uh, all this type of trap can also or station can also be used uh, with ground squirrel baits it works for those too um, but yeah this is this is what I use this is PVC pipe it's a two inch piece of PVC pipe a two inch slip T and a two inch slip cap buy it at the hardware store put them together make a thousand of them it's a real, real good, long-lasting bait station. Then, as far as what do you put in your rat bait station? Well, rat bait. There's two basic different types of this stuff. Um, this one here is a first-generation uh, anticoagulant, and it's the type that is fast-acting. They don't have to eat very much of this stuff. Uh, this is not legal for sale in supermarkets, hardware stores, blah, 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 home convenience stores, or anything like that at all. The only place you can find this type is at the farm stores, at least in Hawaii, that's the case. Um, and it is only legal for use on farms, according to the packaging. Now you got other baits, like this one here is Contract. That's a um, waterproof bait block. Um, Contract is a second generation uh, anticoagulant. This stuff takes a lot longer. Uh, you have to eat a lot of it. I'm tired of it. I, I've been using it, but they just have to eat too much of it. It's costing me a fortune because it's not cheap. And I need something that's going to take them down faster. So I have switched to a stronger version of anticoagulant. If you can find them, because they're hell hard to get, uh, is the uh, peanut blocks. The ones that have peanut embedded in them uh, are with the uh, Generation 1 type anticoagulant. Rats love them, and the stuff's pretty lethal. It'll knock them down fast. They'll eat a bunch of it quick, and they're out of it. The downside to the Generation 1 type that's quick takedown is that the rats can get smart and realize that it's making them sick and they will stop eating it. The second generation stuff, they don't really get smarter than the bait because it's too slow of a kill and they don't quite put it together, you know, and figure it out. Uh, but <clears throat> it's, uh, it's expensive because they're going to eat an awful lot of it for a long time. I actually watched a little teeny titmouse like this, the tiniest little mice we have, eating one of the blocks of bait four days in a row woofing the stuff down same little mouse and it took him four days of feeding constantly on that before he finally stopped showing up if you think you don't have rats you do and if you live here in hawaii you want to be taking care of this because your children could be at risk your pets yourself and i'm appealing to everybody here on the island to bait because the repercussions of your children getting rat lung worm or you picking it up you know or your pets uh, it's it's not nothing you want you don't want this and you know, the rats will eat your your fruit the rats get into everything you know they're a mess anyway uh, you don't really want them around but worse and more so than ever you don't want the rats around you really want to be proactive do dual diligence and uh, uh, you know, and join in a campaign with uh, uh, the rest of us here on the island to get rid of the darn things. At least cut their numbers down because they just breed like crazy. Like I say, I got rats this way, I got rats that way, I got rats back here. Uh, nobody's doing anything about them. Um, so the rats are actually the simplest part of the equation to control. And just because there aren't as many of them. I mean, there are literally billions and billions and billions of slugs. I don't know how many rats there are here, but I'm sure there are more slugs than rats on the island. Um, and it's a little harder to control the slugs. You can't necessarily lure them as well. Anyway, so moving forward into the slug itself, 
the general way that we would control a slug is with some form of a snail or slug bait. Now, if you're doing organic stuff and it's vegetables, especially you got food there, you're going to want to use an item like Sluggo or similar products that are based on iron phosphate. Uh, these things give the slugs gas and slugs can't fart, <laughs> so they die of bloat after they eat this stuff. Um, it's non-toxic, the dog could eat it, you could eat it, it's basically iron phosphate embedded in brewery waste. So there's nothing really lethal about it unless you happen to be a slug or snail. So this is good stuff. The problem in Hawaii with it is it doesn't last long at all. Under our conditions with all the rain over here, I'd say probably 48 hours and this stuff is just gone. Turns into mold and disappears. So it has very little shelf life. You want to be using it, uh, you know, specifically to approach a problem uh, and hopefully you're going to knock them down quick. Uh, also, bear in mind, they are baits. And so it's like if you're out trout fishing, you know, and you put bait on a hook and you toss it into a stream someplace, you'll probably end up with more fish around that hook because you put bait on it than you had in that area originally. The same thing happens with snail and slug baits. You will draw more slugs and snails. So I don't suggest you ever put them around the plants you're trying to protect. Putting them closer to where the slugs and snails might be hiding during the daytime is usually a better approach. They're, you know, out in the cool, shady areas, underneath something. Uh, you, you can set up situations where you can trap them if you just put down, like, a sheet of cardboard on the ground or uh, smooth pieces of plastic seem to work pretty well, plastic sheet and so on, and you flip it over in the morning and do a polka on it. You know, that'll take care of an awful lot of them because they will crawl underneath there uh, come morning to find a place to sleep for the day. Um... So, so then we have methaldehyde baits. This one right here is a Deadline um, product. It's Deadline MPs. This is uh, the classic Deadline type active ingredient, methaldehyde, but it's embedded in a pellet that's uh, paraffin coated. See here, little tiny blue things. These things hold up for a couple of weeks in the rain around here. It's pretty amazing. Now that is nasty stuff, right? Uh, if your pets or something got into it, it's not good. If birds probably won't eat it, uh, but if they did, it would be a problem. They have put a material, I believe, called Bitrex into a lot of this. Uh, so that other creatures will taste the bitterness and not want to eat it. Um, but, you know, beware of how you scatter it. Uh, I don't use that product around food. I use that, like, under nursery tables where the slugs might get, you know. I uh, may use it uh, under fruit trees and things where the fruit's up and in the canopy and not touching the ground. But I don't ever put it around things like a cabbage or lettuce or tomatoes because methaldehyde is uh, pretty dangerous to you too. Uh, in general, I did not use many methaldehyde baits in the past. It wasn't until I moved here and the slug got to be a, a, a life hazard. It was much more important to control them. Uh, and this kind of rainfall and humidity that we have here pretty much demolishes most of the typical baits that you can buy. Uh, that is actually the only bait I've found that will hold up here for a while, and it's quite effective. You can see the dead slugs in the morning after you put it down. So so that's the, that's the easy way. The first thought most folks have, uh, at least first thought I have, slugs, uh, bait for them. Uh, there are bait stations you can buy, and you can make them that will keep the baits drier and will keep them located and centrally. Um, there's some, uh, Surefire makes some uh, slug and snail traps uh, with a recipe for making slug dough, I think, where you, you know, mix yeast and sugar and stuff together and it, it creates a, an attractant to the slug. Slugs are drawn to the smell of fermentation. 
they're also drawn to the smell of mold. Um, they, they like that stuff. And so anything that ferments or is moldy will draw them in. I, I've seen them go for a, a, a Frisbee that got filled with rainwater and had to, cherry tomatoes laying in it that had fermented and made some rather rude tomato wine. And oh, the slugs and snails were just filling that Frisbee. Uh, again, it's the fermentation in there that causes gas inside the mollusk and slugs and snails can't fart. And so I've heard people say, oh, they get drunk on the alcohol and drown, you know, with slug beer and stuff. That's not really true usually. I mean, it could happen, but mostly it's bloating that takes them out from the yeast. Um, all right, so then let's consider deterrence. All right, there is a roll of two-inch wide copper foil with a peel-off adhesive background. This stuff right here can be put around all sorts of things. You can put it around a tree trunk. Uh, you can, if you've got a raised bed, you can put it around. If you've got planters, it can go around. It's not really very bad looking. Uh, you know, there's copper bands around your stuff. It's not 100%. Some of them will get by this. The big ones will kind of leapfrog and get over it. But it's pretty good and it's always there on guard for you while you're not watching <laughs> you're asleep the slugs and snails are trying to cross and they can't so uh, it's real handy that way uh, my suggestion is if you use the copper tape but you do find that you got slugs up and into your lettuce my suggestion throw the lettuce out uh, at least the head that obviously had the slug in it. Uh, as for the rest of them in the tub, if they don't look like the slug was there and isn't chewed, well, just be careful about washing it well. You know, wash it very carefully. Um, the slug slime does not come off easily. That's the biggest problem. with That stuff's like super glue. And so it really does stick down to food. So now a lot of people are scared to death of this disease. Um, I think it's overblown, personally, uh, the fear. You don't want it. I didn't like it. And like I say, some people get it worse than I did anyway. So that's a definite concern. But people get panicked. You know, I have people asking me, oh, well, you grow this or that. You got this rat lungworm in the island. How do you do this? You know, well, anything that you can scrub, anything you can peel, no problem. No problem. Put it under the sink. Scrub it with a brush, you know, whatever it is, a potato, a squash, a sweet potato, a zucchini, you know, a cucumber. Scrub it. You're fine. <laughs> really, you're fine. If you, if you wash it well, um, you won't, you aren't going to have any problems with this. Now, of course, you can't scrub lettuce. And that's a real problem. It's why lettuce and some of the really soft leafy greens are the biggest problem with this stuff. That's, I highly recommend that lettuce be grown in containers that have barriers on them, uh, copper barriers. You can also use two strips of copper with a 9-volt battery soldered between the two. That makes a sluggo electric fence, and that's very effective. I'd say the sluggo electric fence is 100%. There's no slug going past that. The University of Hawaii and its cooperative extension do all kinds of publications on this. This stuff's out there on the web. You can bring it down. This one is Managing Slugs and Snails to Reduce the Risk of Rat Lungworm Infestation. Um, this one over here is Best on Farm Food Safety Practices, <laughs> Reducing Risks Associated with Rat Lungworm Infection and human, uh, I'm not even going to try to say what kind of meningitis that is that it causes. We have this new uh, handout right here. That's You see it around, stuck in, uh, on counters and stuff like that. This handout is about um, rainwater catchment and rat lungworm. Yeah, that's it, folks. I mean, what, about half of us here on the island probably are catching rainwater out of the sky? If the slugs manage to get in there, you got the nematodes in your catchment water. And there are very few filters that will actually take them out 100%. So 
So you make sure that you're keeping your chlorine up to snuff in the tanks. And they have a breakdown over here on this little handout about the filters they tested. And it appears to be that the wound polypropylene ones are the most useless. Um, it looks like uh, on the Culligan uh, CWF, 18 to 41 percent of the nematodes came through that filter. Yuck! Um, the United Filters International uh, has a wound polypropylene. Six to seven percent came through that. Uh, much, much better are the spun polypropylenes. Culligan makes two of those, a PS and a P1. Um, and there you have uh, a PS, 2% of the nematodes made it through, and then the other 7%. The only one they tested that was actually 100% coverage, had zero nematodes, was the uh, um, Matrix AccuCarb. It's a 32 250 10 green, is what it's called, and it's a carbon block filter. Um, that one, nothing came through. Uh, so it is possible to filter the nematodes out of your water, but only if you have the right filter. Also, depending on where your UV light is placed, and I believe it's supposed to be after the filter, uh, is also going to depend on how effective things are. But you got another concern, folks. It just ain't eating the lettuce or your kid picking up a slug and putting it in its mouth. It's in your drinking water. And the county is uh, highly recommending that you uh, just use potable water sources for your drinking and use the rest of the catchment, take a shower and whatever. Um, I think that's a real good idea. It will certainly uh, keep you safe. Yeah, so, you know, here we are in paradise. But I tell you, paradise has got its problems. I got all kinds of people contacting me about wanting to move over to Hawaii. Well, I'll tell you what. We got trouble here too. So if you think you're escaping, eh, no, no, you're gonna have problems when you get here. Uh, and we have more problems show up all the time. One of our uh, Congress people, Ed Case, is introducing legislation that will cause them to have to inspect all the cargo, the cargo containers, and the tourist luggage that's coming in on the island because there's just too much stuff getting in here. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of it's coming in with the tourists. I'd say the vast majority of it's coming in in the commercial shipments and the cargo containers. But, um, you know, it, it just in my time here in Hawaii, uh, the cokey frog showed up, the rat lungworm showed up with the semi slug, uh, the stinging nettle caterpillar showed up, the coffee bean borer showed up over here. Uh, there's more. <laughs> there's more. Uh, those are very notable ones, though, that have really affected us badly here in Hawaii. Um, you know, sometimes I think it's uh, agricultural terrorism. Uh, you want to put a country to its knees, just go ahead and mess with the drinking water supply and our ability to raise crops. On the other hand, it could just be sloppiness because we don't look at this stuff. People come and go here all the time and they carry all kinds of stuff. So beware what you're carrying. If you're coming back over here to the island, really be cautious because Almost everything that lands here takes root and grows or lives. The, the environment is benign and gentle, and everything is happy once it gets here. And so beware of what you might be bringing. And sometimes if you're thinking you're doing the right thing by smuggling something in that you really want, don't do it. Everything likes this place. You bring something in here, it may not do what you wanted it to do. Aloha. Take care of them rats.